Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, we're going to get started, I guess. So this talk is basically the journey that we've taken over the past year at my company of, and around how we survived our first PCI, and mostly PCI, but HIPAA kind of included compliance check. So I work for a company called NAV. What we do is we help try to decrease the death rate of small businesses. The way that we do that is around trying to help educate them around business credit and their personal credit and how those two correlate together and help them be able to use those two to empower them to be able to gain access to capital when the time comes. So, hi, I'm Travis. I am a director of engineering at NAV. Um, here's my information. You can always come and download this stuff and pull this up later. So I'm gonna skip that part. <laughs> so. Should you stay and listen? So my goal here is really to help others understand the changes associated with moving to a Kubernetes-based workload and what that looks like from like a traditional model with virtual machines and what happened with us and the kind of the pitfalls and different things that we had to go through in order to be able to stay compliant and to move forward and, and continue using Kubernetes. So if that interests you, then maybe you should stay. If not, then you're more than welcome to get up and go. I won't have my feelings hurt that bad. I might call you out as you walk out though, so be warned. But, okay, so to set up some common languages, so that as we go through and talk about these different things, we're all on the same plane. So the first thing, regulations. Basically, it's just an authoritative rule dealing with declarate or details um, or procedure. So then compliance is the active process of complying to a desire, demand, proposal, or regimen, or to coercion. Then a standard is something established by authority, custom, or general consent as a model or example. And finally, a classification is a systematic arrangement in groups or categories according to established criteria. So I wanted to set these up just so that we kind of all start at a base plane, because my least favorite thing is when you walk into a room and they start throwing terms around and you're like, I understood, hi. And that's about all I understood from what you said. So here, so going from this then, you know, with the regulations and what compliance means, the standards and classifications. Okay, so which regulations are we gonna be talking about today? So really it's any regulation that deals mostly around data and data protection, which would include HIPAA and PCI DSS. So if you're doing a compliance regulation around process or company maturity, this doesn't really necessarily apply. But if you are doing one around data, then uh, the information in here will be beneficial for you. But at the same time, the things that I'm gonna be talking about mostly are around PCI DSS. And so I'm gonna be using the rules and regulations from there. So just as a side note, I'm not a compliance expert. So if you ask me about PCI regulation 3.2.1 and ask me how that affects global warming, I'm not gonna be able to tell you. I'll get back to you on that, but I typically land on my feet, but at the same time, I don't know these backwards and forwards. Okay, so I know that this page is really hard to read. That's, there's a point. But basically within PCI DSS, there are six major um, areas to it, and then there are 12 particular requirements. So within each of these, you first have build and maintain a secure network, and that means you have to install and maintain a firewall, and then you also, you're not supposed to use vendor supply and defaults or system passwords and other security parameters. Then you have to protect cardholder data, meaning you have to protect stored, or you have to protect the stored card, cardholder data, and you also have to encrypt um, that data in transmission. You also have to maintain a vulnerability management program. So you have to have antivirus, and then you also have to uh, develop and maintain secure systems and applications. Then, oh, one thing I forgot though. Oh, actually, let me, let me get through the rest of these and then we'll go back to the part I forgot. So implementing strong access control measures, then we have regular monitor and, and test networks, and then we also have maintain an information security policy. So throughout all of these, um, the ones that start becoming affected by moving a workload over to Kubernetes, uh, we're gonna start with three, which is protecting the, the data in and of itself. Then we're gonna start talking about five, which is uh, antivirus. 
and seven, which is restricting access, and eight, which kind of go side by side, which is basically authentication and authorization to that data on a need to know. Then 10, tracking and monitoring within your infrastructure. And 11, at the very end, which is regularly testing the security systems and your process around it. So to make those a little bit easier, of the PCI requirements, of the 12 of them, these are the six that end up being affected by it. The other six don't actually get affected by PCI DSS directly. So to start, data protection. Oh, I just found out that my mouse is on there in this giant screen, even though I can't see it really. Maybe in the corner it'll be better. Okay, so we're gonna start with data classification. So the f most important thing is being able to know what data is in your environment and being able to know how to classify that data into different categories and dealing with that data appropriately depending on its classification. So at NAV, what we do is we kind of classify into three categories. We start with what we call red data. Red data would also be what you would say is confidential information. Right, so this is the kind of information that you don't want to hand out on the street and you don't really want people to get access to, being like your social security number, and your passport information, credit card information, your driver's license number, like this stuff being used to personally identify you and who you are. So then yellow data is data that taken individually is really hard to personalize to a particular person. So like if you take, uh, one of the questions I have on here. I thought I put your pet. Maybe I didn't put your pet. Oh, the make and model of your first car. Like I could say Toyota, you know, and there could be a million other people that bought a Toyota first, right? But with yellow data, if you start to combine a lot of these together, then it starts falling more in the realm of red data. So the idea behind yellow data is that it individually, you can't be identified on it. But if you start to combine it together, you have to treat it like red data. So if you're going to be sending information in bulk about someone, you have to treat it like red data because it can be used to identify that person. Then finally, you have green data. Green data is any information that regardless of how much of it you have, there is no way for you to be able to take that data and identify an individual. So that being like an email address, a username, um, a unique ID, um, and basically, you know, if, if you're looking in the database and you have binary information in there, obviously you can't use that to ID someone. Um, so anything like that you can classify as green data. Okay, so with talking about services, your service classification follows the data that it houses. Okay, so if you have a red data inside of your database, the service that controls that database is, will be classified as a red service. And likewise, if you have a green service or data, your service can be classified green, right? So then you get the red green show, any of you late night TV fans of the 90s. I don't know when this show was popular, long time ago. Okay, so as you go along and you start building out all of your different systems uh, with all different shapes and sizes, and then you start interconnecting all of those different pieces together, the data classification starts coming into where you have to start knowing like which of those services is housing a particular type of data. And then the point is to go through and then mark all of your services accordingly. Right now, the thing is, is that you also have to use the, the least common denominator. So if you have a green service or a green data in your database, but you decide to store one piece of red data, that least common denominator rules and it will actually cause, in the top middle, right? so it will cause that service to become a red service, right? So you can't, the idea, and I'm not gonna leave this up here long, but the idea is you cannot mix red and green data. You have to pick one or the other, okay? So knowing those classifications and knowing how to derive that into a, a service, let's look at environments and a, a traditional versus a, a distributed environment. So first, if you, with your traditional environment, very, very basic one, you've got a load balance front end and you have multiple back ends and then those back ends all have data stores, right? So as we said earlier, if you have red data, that will match to your service as well. And then likewise, if you have any green data, those will likewise match to your service. If you're not storing data, you can be classified as a green service. So, 
Then if you look at a distributed or Kubernetes service, cloud native, then you kind of get the same thing. But if you look at the middle server, the problem there is that that host itself, the host that that backend service is on, has access to that database. And that causes a problem for that front end system being a great green service because all of a sudden you're exposing your, your red data to a green service. So the way to fix that is to segregate those hosts away from each other. So you wanna be able to polarize your hosts. So not only do you have to classify the service with the data it's, host, it's housing, but you also have to take that to the host level. You have to take the host and classify it to the data that it has access to. So you have to segregate those off and you can do those with logical separations. So you can cause the two to repel each other. Inside of Kubernetes natively, this is already available to us through taints and tolerances. So I've got a link in here later on if you wanna go look at them. But the idea with a taint is you taint an entire node. You basically put a key value against a node as a taint and that node will not actually schedule your pods on it unless those pods have a corresponding tolerance to match that taint. So then a tolerance basically is the reverse of that taint, right? So if we, if we take a, a node and here it says you have the key and then the value, no schedule. So unless you have a tolerance to tolerate that no schedule, then you won't, the pods won't deploy to that. So you'll get that logical separation. So a tolerance, as you can see here, you can, this tolerance can be defined in two different ways. So you have the key, which the name of it happened to be key, and then the value also happened to be value, but the effect was no schedule. And so adding in that tolerance into this pod spec, you can actually classify that pod as okay to be scheduled onto onto that node. So the pod spec, if you're wondering what that means, if ever you define a deployment or a replica controller or a pod in and of itself and you get that little spec section, that's where you wanna add your tolerance. So it can be applied to a pod itself. Okay, so the other thing you have to worry about is pod to pod network communication. So within this, now we have our host segregated off and we have um, all of our red data on one particular host. We have all our green data on other particular hosts, but at the same time, we have, this, we have an API or a front end or something that wants to be able to communicate to that red service. But we only want one of them to be able to communicate to the red service. We want the API, but not the front end because the information stored on there shouldn't be accessible to the front end. So what you would do here is, um, well, you have to worry about your pod-to-pod -pod network communication, right? So there are a lot of different resources and a lot of different ways to be able to address this. So some of the, one of the first one is using network policies. Now, you, there is the CNI layer that you can run within Kubernetes to be able to create that overlay network that allows all the pods to communicate to one another throughout your cluster. And you can choose, a lot of times you can choose what that CNI layer looks like. Now sometimes if you're on a cloud provider and you're using their managed Kubernetes service, you kind of just get the service that they provide to you. But a lot of times even then, they open up the ability for you to create network policies. Now if you're running your own Kubernetes and you spin up your own CNI networking layer, um, you, get a, you can choose between the plethora of them. And there are quite a few, more, actually more than just these three but these three kind of tend to be the common ones. So when we first started doing network policies, we, um, we ran into quite a few issues. So this is one of the first pitfalls, and we are actually spinning our own Kubernetes with CubeSpray. So we kind of bounced between, we actually tried almost every single one of them. <laughs> But the problem with CNI layers is that it's running the networking of your entire infrastructure. And so if you end up having problems with that CNI networking layer, then you basically have to rebuild your entire cluster on a new CNI layer to then move over to that. And so we did that about four or five times and just got tired of doing that. So 
my advice here is if you are using a cloud service that is providing this for you, you're probably good to go. Now, if you're not and you're spinning your own, just be aware of that. So talk with the vendor, make sure that everything is kosher and good to go before you try launching this into production, which we thought we did, but obviously we didn't test it enough. Once we started putting more load to it, then we started having issues with different reasons. Um, but basically, talk with, we'll talk with the vendor, make sure everything is good to go, and that you have some support there so that you don't have to stop and rebuild your cluster right in the middle of the day when something starts going awry. So they are good, they're, they're out there, and, and this is a really good way to be able to start defining the network policies. Now, I don't think I have this on the next slide. Yeah, so another thing with the network policies, the great thing about them is that it's using a CRD, so you can use the custom resource definitions within Kubernetes that you're already using for your pods and your deployments and your and whatever else, and use those to also create your, your network policies to be able to define that segregation between who is able to talk to who, right? So if anyone is familiar with AWS, then they use security groups, right? And that's kind of the, the common way to be able to say that this service can talk to this service. Now, with network policies, it's the same principle, but just in a very cloud-native Kubernetes-centric way. So the next option is service meshing. So service meshes, again, there's quite a few of these. And the funny thing is, it's like, you go through all, these, through all of these options and there's always a fair amount of options here. Because the funny thing is, is that we're all kind of fighting the same problems, right? We're all kind of figuring out how to find resolutions around these. Which is a great thing, right? That's the reason that we're all here. We're all trying to figure out how to move forward and how to continue to perpetuate technology and movement and, and drive faster, deliver quicker. But at the same time, we all kind of run into this, oh crap, I don't know what to do about this, right? And so the great thing is, is that there are a lot of options. So with service meshing, the big difference here is that you're not using a CNI networking layer. So this is stuff that typically will run as sidecars along with your pod, which makes it a lot easier to replace if you do end up with issues. Um, but at the same time, service meshing, the downside to that that we've found out is that it's really not a drop-in solution yet. Like there hasn't been one that we've found that we can fully just say, go install yourself in my cluster and make it glorious. It usually just brings it down, right? So we, ha we have yet to find that golden rule, or uh, silver bullet, sorry, not golden rule. So, they're great, and they can do something very, very similar to the network policies in the sense that you can define who gets to talk to who. And that makes them really, really good. Plus, on top of that, they also add in some other features. Like, they, they open up a ton of metrics and visibility into the traffic happening within your network. They also give you the ability to add in TLS everywhere, so you're encrypting even internal to your network, not only on the internet. I um, mean, they give you things like um, pod failovers or retries and stuff like that. Like, there's a lot of really good reasons to use a service mesh, but if you're using it for strictly network policies, there are probably easier ways to go about doing it. So the next one is cloud native firewalls. Now, I kind of looked around for these a little while, and I really only found two, but then I walked past a booth that happened to say cloud native firewall in, in the vendor room, so apparently there's a third one. <laughs> but I just, I didn't add them in here, I didn't have time. So anyway, Twistlock and Aqua, what they do is they um, run as a daemon set inside of your cluster, and they sit there and watch the traffic happening between all of your uh, Docker pods. And they can, in turn, then be able to monitor all of that and tell you like what's happening within your infrastructure. And then within that, within a separate system, you can go and define you know, the, this is how my services should be talking to each other and be able to control them in that manner. So the thing that we found with cloud native firewalls is that it's actually, I, I like these more to kind of just tell you that things are going the right way and not as much as the actual way to define this. So they work, so um, Twistlock is the, the service that we ended up using, and they use a machine learning um, API, or not API, sorry, a firewall, which is great because it kind of teaches itself what services should be talking to each other, but at the same time, when we want to create a hard rule, it kind of makes it really difficult to be able to do that 
because the way to teach it to do that is just not to send that traffic to that other pod, but if there is traffic going from between those two pods, then how do you say that's not a good rule, right? So in this instance, we like these solutions, the cloud native firewalls, a lot more just to tell us if there's something happening that shouldn't be happening and not as much around the actual application of creating those divisions between the, the pods talking to one another. So we are looking more at the service mesh or the CNI networking layer to actually do this, the segregation and the, um, for the, the classifications around the networking. So the next part, and that, that the data, really is kind of the biggest one. Being able to segregate your data, keep it separate, being able to um, know what services have access to that data and which ones don't, and being able to control that is really the biggest problem that we ran into. Um, and so that's, uh, it took up like half the time. So the next one we're gonna move on to is virus protection. So this comes from requirement five that says use and regularly update antivirus software or programs. So the great thing about virus protection, do you go to the Docker website and you go and search virus protection with Docker, then you actually get taken to this page. I'm gonna read this really quick. It says when antivirus software scans files used by Docker, these files may be locked in a way that causes Docker commands to hang. One way to reduce these problems is to add the Docker data library on, or let me skip the parentheses, to the antivirus's exclusion list. However, this comes with the trade-off that viruses or malware in Docker images, writable layers or, or uh, of containers or volumes are not detected. If you do choose to exclude Docker's data library, or Docker's data directory from background virus scanning, you may want to schedule a recurring task that stops Docker, scans the data directory, and restarts Docker. How many people here have ever stopped Docker on a node running in production? Yes, so have I. It stops everything, right? <laughs> so don't do that. It's not a great thing to do. So anyway, you read this and you're just kind of like, what? Uh, okay. So then I went and I searched up uh, a company that offers virus protection, and that being like one of their primary offerings. And they even say, hey, we can do virus protection around Docker. I'm like, fantastic. Wait, wait a minute. When antivirus software scans files user Docker, this is the same thing. So how are you, uh, are you kind of, do you just give up at that point? So anyway, the tool is only as good as the implementation allows it to be, right? <laughs> so traditional virus protection in cloud native is not a very good implementation of virus protection. Or as most would put it, you're trying to put a square peg in a round hole, right? So how do you defy viruses, keep your service safe while allowing the right traffic to be able to pass through. So the first thing, um, you have to look at the containers themselves. So one of the big pieces of this is being able to do static scanning of the images. Now there are a lot of different offerings in here and it was even brought up today in, in the keynote um, from Aqua themselves that this is something that some of these tools are even open source. A lot of the times the scanning tool is open source. And so you can start scanning your tools today without any, any cost to you. Now, given you do have to go find a tool and start scanning them to see what happens, but at the same time, um, it's very easy to be able to drop into and it gives you a lot of information. And a lot of times these scanning tools, they'll scan the operating system, they'll scan the software dependencies you've installed inside of the, that image for your application and any third party libraries or dependencies you've included as well. So at NAV, we use um, quite a few languages, but Ruby being one of the primary ones. And a lot of times these scanners will even find things within our gems and they will tell us if our gems are outdated. And so it is really good. So it's, it's really good. And it gives you a lot of information around the software dependencies itself, but around the operating system too. So this is, this is an absolute must. You absolutely have to be scanning your images. 
And there was a side note to this. Don't just, don't just go and scan your images and then go put them in your repository and then have your repository public and open to everyone, right? So they, it does you, it, it kind of brings you back to this one, right? Like you're not implementing the tool in the correct way. So what you want to do is you want to scan your images, but then you want to have a repository that you trust, meaning that there are not a lot of people that have access to it. It's not open to your entire company. It's not obviously not open to the world, but it's protected and it's safe and it's secure. And you know that anything in there is there because you put it there, right? So after you scan your images, then you want to make sure that you put everything that you scan inside of a repository that you trust. So for us, again, like I was saying earlier, that we ended up using Twistlock. And, and in this instance, for us, it became really easy to be able to do this with the ability that Twistlock gave to us and then using CoreOS, Core well, I guess it's Container OS. So Container OS, and the other great thing about it is that it's built specifically to be able to run containers, right? So it's kind of a read-only operating system. And the great thing about that is that pretty much anything that's running on that is going to be a container for the most part. But we do want to make sure that if anything weird happens on that host, that we are either notified or it gets killed or whatever else. So the way that we went about it is to, we took the immutable approach. So what we decided is we allow Twistlock to say either this container or this instance appear to be a little funky, so we're just going to kill them. And we're like, that's cool, because if you kill it, then Kubernetes is going to go spin me up another container that probably doesn't have the problem, because I've scanned my images, and I put them in a trusted repository, and it should be good going back into my ecosystem. And if you kill that host, I'm also OK with that, because my system knows that I want at least so many nodes. And if one dies, it's going to go spin it back up. And so we use the immutable, immutable approach here for the hosts itself and also for the containers running on it. So if any of them happen to get anything suspicious, then they just go down. And then we just bring something right back up in their place. So to kind of give you an example of this, um, within the Twistlock system itself, so it, they have a section called Radar. Now, inside of here, it shows you, it kind of doesn't show you because there's this giant picture in the front, but I couldn't find another picture. But it shows you your, your ecosystem, and it also shows you like the rating of each of your systems, whether they're, you can see one in the corner right here, but you get a green one versus like a really, really dark red one. You obviously don't want the really, really dark red ones, but you can kind of see where your vulnerabilities may lie within your own system. And then by clicking on them, and this is, as far as I know, this is the same through most of the offerings, but and when you click on them, then it gives you a detailed report as to which issues are critical, which ones are high, and how to address those and fix them, which is even better. So, and then here, this shows you an incident that happened within a container. Either you get a hijack process, someone's port scanning you, or you have some lateral movement within the container itself. And then again, like we just let Twistlock shut it down. So the next piece is authorization and authentication. Now, the great thing about this one is it literally is one slide. So Kubernetes role-based access control for the win here. Kubernetes already has role-based access control built in. And I've got a link here for you. But basically, you get to define a role. Here, we're creating a pod reader where um, you're able to get watch and list on pods, right? Then we want to bind that to someone. So here we're taking Jane and we're giving Jane the role of pod reader, right? So Jane is now able to go in and get watch and list pods. And that's all she's able to do from that control. And so being able to authorize and restrict access to people that only need, well, a need to know basis, right? Bob may not need to be able to list the pods because he's in marketing. So we don't want Bob to be able to come in and, and start looking at pods. But Jane may be a developer, and it's something that she needs to do. So being able to control that within Kubernetes is really, really easy um, using the RBAC system. Now the last piece being, I always get these backwards, authentication. 
So what we did with authentication is we used our Google accounts, and then we tied that to the Kubernetes OpenID. Now there's even a script, the Kubernetes OICD helper, that you log into Google and go authenticate as yourself, and then you can use this to then generate your cube config file. So then that cube config file then identifies you particularly into the, your different clusters, and it, you identify as you. And then it, with our back end this tied together, then we know who's able to do what within each cluster. And you can fine tune all of that. Okay, tracking and monitoring. So this one, um, from requirement 10, this basically just means that you know, you, you've got three big areas to worry about here. You need to be able to audit, you need to have logging, and you need to have monitoring. So the auditing, you need to know what happens in your system when things change as far as the system is concerned. Logging, you wanna know what your system is, is doing, what your applications are doing, and monitoring. You wanna have a visibility into particular metrics around your system. So with auditing, Again, Kubernetes for the win here. They have an auditing system. You can go turn it on, and I have a link here for you to be able to go look at that. But it can show you when things change within the Kubernetes ecosystem and by whom, which is fantastic. And so that gives you exactly the control you need as far as auditing is concerned. So logging and monitoring. So I didn't put any suggestions up here because there are a million of them. But when we went through and started selecting these, I decided to give you some things to consider. So. Two things, make it easy for developers, because if it's not related to barbecuing or if it's not related to the latest topic of functional versus object-oriented programming in the office, then a lot of times you're gonna lose their interest. But then at the same time, you need to make it easy for your operations, because if it's not related to Star Wars or it's not related to teaching them how to throw their phone out the window at 3 a.m. when they get paged, then they're probably gonna lose interest, right? So within the logging and monitoring system, we had to come to a compromise on both sides. We had to make something that was super simple for the developers, and that ended up being their code themselves. We didn't want to pull them into a different code base, use a different tool or something else. We, we figured out tools that would work with their code and it, so that they didn't have to add independencies or anything else, and they loved that. Then on the operational side, um, the things for us was really around the process and workflow. Like We didn't want to have to add in additional steps in order to to do more, we just wanted things to kind of run the way that they were. So those are the things to consider when looking at those options. So finally, vulnerabilities, and I think I'm running out of time. So pipeline, best practices. Um, the vulnerabilities really just comes down to uh, using things inside your pipeline, really. So vulnerabilities inside the applications themselves, but you want to move your static image container scanning to your pipelines so that every time they build, they know whether or not they're building or causing new vulnerabilities inside of your system. And this is, again, very simple to do. A lot of the open source tools are very centric to the CLI, and you can run them inside your pipelines. Then another big thing for us is that you want to use images that you trust. And so we created a, an Alpine image, and we had all of our other images built off of that. So if we wanted to push out an operating system patch, we pushed it to our gold master image, and then that would then, at any time a developer built after that would pick up that fix, and when they deployed, it would go out into production. So this made it super easy for our ops team to be able to fix operating system level defects and have that go out to the rest of the teams. Then two more things, so static application and dynamic application security testing. So there are, again, our tools for these, but again, try to, as much as you possibly can, add them into the pipeline so that all of your security and all of your tests are happening in the pipeline and, and your developers get that immediate feedback as soon as possible about knowing whether or not they're causing any new vulnerabilities or issues. So that's pretty much it. So those are the six different areas that, to consider when moving to, um, to Kubernetes workflows. And, I don't know if I have any time, but if I do, I'd be willing to take any questions. And if not, thank you for coming.